Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, for last technical session of the day on the topic Form and Content of Audit Reports, including CARO, EOM, OIM. To present on the topic, we have CA Abraham B. Charyan, and I now request CA Gita Ali, Bangal Branch Past Chairperson, to kindly come forward and welcome our speaker with our floral token. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, madam. To briefly introduce, Mr. Abraham is Bachelor of Commerce from St. Joseph College of Commerce, Bangalore, and fellow member of Institute of Child Accountants of India. Presently working as partner in the Verma and Verma handling major audits for the past 10 years. He has been speaker at Institute of Child Accountants, Bangalore branch, and other professional colleges. An active participant in the professional development and continuing education programs of ICR. Member of Expert Committee on Indirect and State Taxation by the Chapter of Industry and Commerce, ex-member of Asian Arab Chambers of Commerce. With this uh, brief introduction, I welcome you to the session, sir. Over to you. Hi. Good evening. Yeah. So, uh, I'm happy that I got the post-tea session and not the lunch session. <laughs> I'm sure all of you are now looking forward to go, going home. So, I'll make it very quick and brief. I know what it is not the most spiciest thing to enjoy. I'll try to make it as spicy as possible. Okay? So, uh, <coughs> so, uh, the, as you can see, the topic that's given to me is audit report form and content. So, it basically comes down to whatever we have studied in the last uh, earlier sessions, it finally comes down to this. Right? You report all of this in the audit report and uh, it finally comes down to one little para called opinions. In that para it comes down to two favorite words, true and uh, exactly. So I was trying to do some research in terms of you know the genesis of this word true and fair. When, when did this start? So there's, uh, there's not really any uh, you know uh, what do you call it, I couldn't get anything after I googled it, the uh, only thing that came up was that uh, it's been bought over to us by obviously the uh, uh, English, right? So it started with the uh, Institute of English and Wales. So apparently true and fair is never defined, even in Companies Act it's not defined. So it's based on judgments, where it's been uh, well uh, put out or thought out and you know, mentioned in uh, legal judgments and that's how the concept has uh, creeped into, uh, into the accounting and auditing provision probably in the late 1800s. So since then, we have this uh, two favorite words, true and fair. And surprisingly, the, the Americans use this uh, as different terminology. They don't use true and fair. Okay, so that's a homework for all of you to find out what is it that the Americans use. Right? So they always like to be different, like how Mr. Trump is. Right? <laughs> so uh, so we'll, 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 uh, I'll move on to the subject matter. So there's been a lot of changes, especially with effect from this year, April 1st, 2018. That is, uh, financial year is uh, starting from this year. There's a lot of changes uh, in respect of all the essays from 700 onwards. So 700, 700, uh, there's new standard essay called 701, 705, 706 and 720, all of them have been uh, revised. So I'll go to that. So uh, even though I said there are only two words, the main uh, facets of audit opinion are here. Uh, apart from these aspects, one thing I want to highlight is going concern. Yeah, this is not being specifically bought out uh, as part of our reporting. I'll come to that a little later. So, so these are the new updates as well as the uh, new uh, essay itself, which is 701. Uh, if you're looking at your presentation, I have made some few changes because I was traveling and I sent the presentation at the last moment. So I made some changes over the weekend. Okay, so 701 is called Key Audit Matters and that's something that is a, something which is very new to India. In fact, it is relatively new to the globe and we seem to be in a big hurry to catch up. It was uh, put out last year as applicable then the institute, uh, postponed it by one year. So, it's going to be applicable from this year. So, I will uh, come to the main, uh, I mean, before that, we'll, uh, yeah, I'll just go through the QRB's uh, report has just been published, uh, I think, last month. So some of the findings I have taken out only in respect of the audit report of the 700 to 720, they have highlighted some uh, findings. 
So if you see the first thing is the failure to provide audit report in specified format. So the format is of utmost importance. Right? So that's the first finding that they have that the format has not been stuck to. Where this is format, it's there only in SA, it's not there in companies. Are. So it's there only in the uh, standards of auditing and we need to stick to that because the QRB is open in this. Second is the basis for qualified uh, opinion para is missing in many of the reports is what they have highlighted. Second or the third part is the most tricky part which is called the information or inconsistency in other information. So there is a standard which deals with it, this is called 720. This is basically, when you look at an annual report, right, it has a lot of other reports as well. Let's say a challenge message or a board of directors report or a management uh, discussion analysis. All of this information that is contained there will have both financial and non-financial data. This standard makes it our job to look at that and say if there is any inconsistency in that with the financial statements and report it. You know how literally impossible that is in India. So, but now they have revised that standard to bring in a specific para also into the audit report itself where you need to highlight this. The early standard said we needed to do it but they didn't say how to go about it. They were just left it in no man's land that way. So no, I didn't see any major reporting on this aspect but this is one of the findings in QRB so it's pretty interesting how this is going to play out in, into the future. So the standard has been revised, the form itself has been revised. The opinion used to be the last para, now it's the first para. Then there is a basis for opinion and then there is a going concern. This is a specific amendment which is applicable in fact from uh, last year itself. In 1718 financial year itself it's applicable. Where if there is an, uh, what do you call, uh, material uncertainty, a significant uncertainty regarding going concern, you are supposed to bring it out as a separate para in our audit report. Before this used to be covered under emphasis of matter. They have carved it out of emphasis of matter. They say they want to highlight it specifically. So this is a very uh, important uh, change and it's effective for audits which are doing right now. Not for 1890. It's already applicable for 1780. Then the key audit matters which I said is a new standard which, which is a pretty spicy one. I will we'll come to that. And then there is the usual management responsibility, auditor's responsibility and the report on other legal and regulatory requirements. <laughs> One main thing is that the basis of opinion para is required, unlike the earlier in the past, but it was required only if it's a modified opinion. It is not required just for the opinion. Even if it's an unmodified or clean report, you have to give a basis of opinion para. So that's a major change. So this is what the basis of, uh, you know, basis for opinion para states. As I said, it, it's applicable even for clean uh, audit reports, not just for modified audit reports. And it includes a statement specifically that the auditor is independent of the entity in accordance with the relevant ethical requirements, which is basically the code of ethics as well as the Companies Act requirements. These are the two, uh, this is one major departure from what was being done in the past. The auditor's responsibility para has undergone a lot of changes. They have bought in a lot more, uh, what do you call, what is already there in the standards earlier has now been explicitly bought out in our responsibility para. It doesn't really increase the scope, it is already part of what we have done, but it is now being stated specifically into our uh, responsibility para. So it makes it all the more onerous and all the more the documentation has to be maintained because you are publicly declaring that we have done all this or it will be a responsible cause. So this is a very uh, important uh, and a major change. One thing as I said is a reasonable assurance. This word existed before but they have said what it means. So they have said that even though it, it offers a high level of assurance, it is not a guarantee. So to that extent, people's misconception that if it is audited that there is nothing, nothing has gone wrong is probably what uh, they are trying to highlight by bringing in this uh, modification to responsibility by that. <coughs> Apart from that, I said earlier that the going concern is a big issue or a, a big matter that they want to puff, I mean, bring out into the main report. So they have included a, we have to have a conclusion on the appropriateness, which is basically the, the management also has to conclude on why they are assuming it's a going concern. And then we have to conclude on whether that assumption is right or not, and that's included in our responsibility plan. Very uh, important thing is this. Uh, that the, our audit evidence
is, is only up to the date of our audit report. This has been explicitly mentioned now. So for uh, people who had doubts, this is now very, very clearly mentioned in our uh, panel that anything that happens post that, we cannot put into our report. So there could be an event which is so catastrophic that after we sign, it has affected the going concern uh, assumption of the entity. But that is not our responsibility, post the date of signing. So that has been explicitly brought out. I am only talking about the auditor's responsibility panel. I am not going into the management's responsibility panel because I thought it's not very relevant for us as of now. Please. I don't know if you can read it, it's too small probably. Uh, I will take the second part which is the communication with uh, those charged with governance. So we are supposed to now, uh, we stated, this is already, a, I don't know, I think Sharad would have taken it in his earlier 315 and all that, right? So those are the paras, uh, standards which deal with us communicating with the board or an audit committee. So this is supposed to do any way as per the existing standards. This is now being mentioned that we are doing it. So the minute you do this, you will have to have a document which sh shows that you have actually communicated all the matters of concern at the planning stage itself with the management. Even a oral communication is allowed, but then I don't know what happens in a review, if it's a quality review or a QRV review or FRLP review or even a peer review, how do you prove that they have done a, over the phone call, I have talked to them, that's not going to work. So documentation becomes extremely critical here. So what we have done, Earlier, and this required the standard is not being explicitly brought out, makes it even more onerous on us to ensure the documentation is maintained. The other aspect is only in respect of CFS, where uh, you know, where we are relying on other auditors of let's say a subsidiary or a joint venture, yeah, they are trying to very clearly uh, bifurcate the responsibility of the audit, saying that we have done audit only of the holding entity or any other subsidiary that we have independently ourselves done. That means a signing auditor. And in case of uh, subsidies or joint ventures which are done by some other audit, it goes on to say that the audit, its direction, its supervision, everything is done by them. I have no role in it. And we have purely relied on their report to come to our conclusion. So these are, as I said, aspects which are already there in the existing standards but are being explicitly, explicitly brought out. The other so with that I will go into key audit matters. This is a, what do you call it, an extremely new uh, concept that's come in. As I said earlier, it was applicable last year and then the institute uh, postponed it by one year. So what is a key audit matters? This is why I said it's a, it's a bit of a spicy, spicy subject. So it requires us to disclose what we thought was the, the most significant audit issue in our audit report. So can you imagine in Indian context highlighting the most difficult audit issue into public domain and how it has been dealt with in our audit report. So here it is going, it is assuming that the corporate governance levels are so good that everything is discussed and it's being bought out. So this is what I said is going to work. It's going to be very nice to read the audit report. I don't know how it's going to be. Either it's going to be really boring because everyone is going to have the same state reports, same you know, copy paste of words, or it's going to be really implemented in its true essence. You'll have some good reading material and you start reading listen company audit reports. So, this is a very uh, <coughs> new concept which is there only in, I think, very few countries as of now. And we have gone ahead and started trying to implement it from this year onwards. So why disclose is what so they have said that it, it, it enhances the communicative value of the auditor's report by giving greater transparency as well as it gives the intended users some more information to go back to the management, you know, to have a nice dialogue with them like what is this, can you give us more information, can you throw more light on it. So like an AGM, you probably have a more, more, much more of a Spicer AGM once key audit matters get disclosed. So it's right now made applicable only to listed entities. It has to be given under a separate heading itself in the audit report. The key audit matters, as I said, is not a substitute for a 
modify the opinion. So if you need to qualify an opinion or uh, give an adverse opinion or a disclaimer, you cannot use the key audit matter to support that process. That will happen on its own. This is a separate matter. <coughs> and it is, as I said, it's prohibited to be given in case you are given a disclaimer of opinion. Unless it is mandated by law to give it. So if you are given a disclaimer of opinion, you are not allowed to give a key audit matters. Because you are not expressing an opinion. <coughs> so what is the contents of uh, key audit matters? So the key audit matter has to have two major uh, points in it. Why you chose that particular matter as a key audit matter and how you have dealt with it in your report. So these are the two major points that has to uh, come through in your report under the heading key audit matters. How do you determine key audit matters? As uh, I think Sharad just now spoke about significant audit risk. That's a starting point. Uh, any uh, management judgments, critical estimates or assumptions that they have used, or any significant transaction or event that has happened during the year. These are the three major categories from which you could pull out or call out a can for, for presenting in your audit report. You, I'm not sure how many of you have done Indias. In Indias, you are supposed to disclose the critical uh, accounting policies which require most critical judgments. Right? So that could be a easy uh, you know, point where, where from where you can start off. Because they are disclosed, let's say, uh, financial uh, instruments like an ECL or a derivative or any other provisioning policy that they have, there is a significant amount of uh, judgment or uh, assumptions being used, have to be anyway disclosed under interest. So then, if you choose a key audit matter which is not considering any of these things, you will have to be extra careful to justify why you are not looking at those. Because so those are considered very, very critical from an accounting point of view. So that's the first ground from where you can look at it, apart from the significant audit risk. So this is how you try, I mean, this is a inverted triangle in, in, in the manner in which you try to arrive at the most significant uh, matter that requires your identification and to be put into the camp pattern. So again, it's judgmental, right? There's no threshold. No, no. It's pure judgment. That's why I said it's going to be very interesting how this is going to happen in India. Because uh, it's being done in countries which are probably one generation ahead of us in terms of other aspects, reporting, governance and all that. But this standard we are pushing so fast ahead, whereas the other aspects probably will do a catch up. So that's why it's going to be a little interesting and challenging how this is going to get implemented. And that's one of the reasons why they postponed it by Himalaya. So you can imagine with the spate of all the resignations that have happened, if the standard was there and they had to disclose why they, some of those audit matters, it, it, I don't know how, how it would be. So before you put in your key audit matters, you are supposed to communicate what you have selected as key audit matters with those charged with governments. And uh, if there is nothing to report, then you need to state also why. You, you need to inform them as well as in your own audit report, if you have no key audit matters, you need to state that there are no key audit matters. You cannot just leave, uh, leave out this paradigm anymore. So even if the audit is not differing with the management, but still you need to bring the key audit matters into the... See, this is, this is not a point of difference. This is a point where you think a significant matters that you have looked the most significant matters and how you have dealt with it in your uh, audit and how you have dealt with it in your audit report. It is not a point of difference at all. If there is a point of difference as I said before and if it is material, you will have to qualify the report. So we just take as an example provision for bad debts. Yeah. So I say 100, you say ETF management. Right? So where... That will be a qualification. If the amount is material, it will go into qualification. If uh, <coughs> this provisioning of arriving at 100 is a very significant uh, matter of judgment and you think that that is something that the audit, I mean the readers of the financial statement would like to understand better, then you would highlight it. I would come to one or, one or two examples of what is generally given as a key audit uh, matter that will give you some more uh, realistic uh, picture of what is expected to be disclosed there. 
So these are certain chances when key matter is not communicated. Either the law, law requires you not to do it. When an order determines that the adverse consequences of disclosure being a matter not previously disclosed outweighs the public benefits of such communication. So something that I have already disclosed in public, then you can very well go ahead and disclose it. Because there is no uh, doubt in, in such a case. When the auditor has already dealt with the issue in, as I said, in a, mod in a modified report. That means if it's qualified, then you are not supposed to bring it into the key audit matter. It will stay in the modification parallel itself. And as I said, before the auditor de you know, determines based on the facts and circumstances that there are no key audit matters to communicate, then it has to be stated specifically. Some of the issues, I have looked at uh, what happens in a consolidated financial statements if, in a, for a key audit ma matter reporting. So, you could be the holding company's uh, auditor and there could be a subsidy or a component where this is not applicable. So then what happens in a consolidated uh, audit report is not very clear right now. Uh, if it is applicable, you obviously pick it up from there and put it into your report. But if it is not applicable, are you expected to go into their uh, audit reports, go one level beyond that and then enquire and then put something into the CFS audit report. There is no clarity added now. We will uh, await some more guidance from the initiative. It is somewhat similar to IQFR. Yeah, if, you, if you have a subsidiary, especially if it is outside India, it is not applicable, right? Then when you consolidate and present it here, what do you do? So you see that it is, it is restricted to only these, these entities. That's how we like to suitably modify a report. Something similar you may have to do if there is no specific guidance that comes about in the immediate future. So, some of the examples of key audit matters, as I said, are, uh, I've just listed them out. So, revenue recognition could be something, provisions and convenience here, which is highlighted, taxation matters, uh, impairment of assets, if you're implementing an ERP system. Because you have, there's an overhaul of the entire financial reporting, operating, every, every process has been overhauled, or been redone or automated. So that's a pretty key matter. And most of them will disclose it in their uh, board report or somewhere or the other. So it, it, it has probably makes, makes you know, sense for the auditors also to really look at it from a point of view of key audit matter reporting. So I have looked at the international uh, experience, so it's mainly UK and some Gulf countries, uh, I don't know, and some African countries, so I am going to discount those. So it's, it's UK seems to be leading on, on this matter, they seem to have implemented more than three years ago. So the top 10 matters that uh, generally comes up for uh, reporting as scans are asset impairments, revenue recognition, allowance for doubtful debts, goodwill impairment, taxation, financial instruments, investments, valuation of inventories, property valuation, insurance. So many of these things you can see there's a lot of significant assumptions and all which go into valuing and measuring these, uh, some of these items. That's why I said going back to your India's uh, disclosures is a good starting point for uh, what to disclose in CAN. This is a AstraZeneca PLC. This is a listed company in UK. So I have looked at their uh, annual report and I have just carved out one particular, they have multiple uh, disclosures on CAM, they have disclosed more than three or four uh, key audit matters. So only I have just pulled out one, which is basically on litigation and contingent liabilities. Since it is a pharma company, they have reasoned out why they have considered this as a key audit matter. If you see the second parallel says pharmaceutical industry is a heavily regulated industry which increases the inherent litigation risk. This is the reason why they are selecting this particular uh, aspect of matter for disclosure as a key audit matter. Because they always have patent uh, infringements, both ways will be there. There is even antitrust regulations. So all these things are generally always going on. Even in India, pharma companies, every time there is a US FDA problem, the stock, market, stock price here gets affected, right? These could be issues that now come out in key audit matters. So why the US FDA didn't give an approval for a plant that's in India? What is the issue with that plant? So those are aspects that will now start 
probably coming out in key audit matters. So that's why I said now reading an audit report will probably be a little more interesting. They have also said how they have addressed this uh, specific matter in the audit, uh, as part of the audit as well as in the audit report. So this is the, they have said that they have evaluated the design and tested the operating effectiveness of controls <coughs> in determination of provisions. So going back to what Sharad had said, he had said, right, let's say for provision for unit back there, where only the top management is involved in arriving at that. That's something that will have a huge management bias. <coughs> so if, if it's an estimate that is prepared bottom up, that means there is a person at the bottom, at the lower level of management who is preparing it, then it goes up to his boss and then it goes up, then there is a process that is involved. And that process if it's been followed, the chance of the bias creeping is far lesser. That is why they have said that they are testing the design and testing the operating effectiveness of the controls. But in India, even though in listed companies, you will find that many of them are promoter control, heavily promoter control. As he said, one of the biggest risks in audits is management override of controls. This is something that actually happens from a private limited company all the way to a listed company. Find all, all well and find the tools, corporate governance and all that. But we know practically they can always override it. That is a big threat all the time that happens to an audit. That uh, management override can always happen, biases can happen. They can tell you some st certain stories which will you know, with assumptions and based on what they have said, it looks very, very believable and you go ahead with it and it could probably not be the actual case. So, they have said that they have checked these controls and operating entity of all these controls. And that they have had discussions with the group's legal counsel. So, testing all this becomes very important. So, litigations, you should try and get hold of the lawyer who is representing the firm, the company and try to get him to reply directly to you of what is the summary of the cases and what is the status of the case and what in his opinion, in his professional opinion whether this is going to go against or for the company. These are some of the aspects that you should try and uh, get through an audit. So and when you have to disclose, see before all this is not being disclosed, now to disclose such matters uh, without any documentation you find it extremely difficult. And if you skip it, then you are you're like a deer caught in the headlights. So, it's, audit is becoming more and more onerous. The more you disclose, the more tough it's going to get for all of us. Just a matter of reflection. So, this we are already disclosing mm -hmm. what's in the condition liability. Absolutely. So, there itself we are giving a message to the minister, though it's not a firm liability, it is contingent. By bringing it once again into the key audit matter, Aren't we repeating the same stuff once more or? You are trying to emphasize it basically. You are trying to say that in a pharmaceutical company, please look at it and read those specific notes because they have a significant bearing on this financial statement. And we have also looked at it and dealt with it in this manner in our audit. That is what they are trying to bring out. So that more and more elements of the financial statements are being highlighted to the users so they go and read it. Otherwise nowadays, you know the latest <coughs> financial statement runs into 50 pages. The amount of disclosures that somebody has to go through, with, a general person will not understand most of it. I mean, you and I find it difficult to go through most of it. So imagine a general user of a India's uh, financial statement. So for him to understand and look at specific issues, these aspects, uh, it will yeah, it will help you in narrowing down to looking at the key 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 issues rather than getting lost in the 100 notes that will be cross-referenced in these standards. I mean, in these reports. So isn't that the key? Only highlight things which are already there. Yes. <coughs> Not something new. No. It, is a, it was an audit issue that you are dealing with. It's a matter that's already existing in the company. Already disclosed by the management elsewhere. That's fine. That has no that has no relevance to this. Even if it's disclosed, not disclosed, it's, it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. If it is disclosed, you're supposed to cross-reference. That's why you'll see in this thing they've actually referred to the page number. So there's a lot of judgment that goes into this. It's it's uh, not very, it's definitely not rule based. So uh, it, it's an evolving 
practice, I mean, uh, evolving standard. It is new in India, it's new, it's very new, even in globally, it's quite new. Most of the advanced countries have not implemented it. They are going to be the, probably, the, probably the biggest democracy that's coming to quit. Mainly from a financial matter. If it's a non-financial matter, we are not expressing an opinion as such. They have not bifurcated that, isn't, I mean, the standard is not, but I am assuming that's what the intent is. So we are not experts beyond that. So I will go on to the modifications. This is something that I have always found that people use the word qualified and modified report like a synonym. There is a difference. A qualified opinion is a type of modified opinion. So a modified opinion has three categories. One is a qualified opinion, two is an adverse, three is a disclaimer. Okay, so a qualified opinion is a kind of a modified opinion and not a, not a vice versa situation. This is how they are said to go ahead uh, in terms of uh, when do you qualify, when do you issue adverse opinion, when do you issue a this. This matrix is there in the standard also, it helps you in uh, looking at it. The main aspect is whether it's material, whether it's pervasive. <coughs> These are the two main uh, conditions that you have to look at. If it is material, not pervasive, you conclude with a qualification. If it's something that's pervasive, then you have to look at it from the point of view of whether it's adverse or even, yet, even to the extent of a disclaimer. A disclaimer is very, very rare. Even an adverse is rare. Qualified you would find quite a few. But uh, I have seen probably just in my life just one disclaimer of an opinion. That the, the entire books were, half of it was lost to fire, the remaining was seized by the income tax department. <laughs> And that, I think it goes back all the way to 1998. So that's all how I found it. I guess nowadays they prefer to resign than get this. <laughs> the standard, see, just going back to the standard allows you to resign. It's actually, most of the thing is that you communicate the issue with those charged with governance, ask them to correct it. If they cannot correct it, then you look at the next option. Next option is. Please pull out with the assignment. And if the law does not allow you to pull out, then only you give such extreme opinions. Otherwise, the next first option is to pull out the assignment. But see, what happens is all of this is not fully known 
it's easy for me for us to sit here and pass judgment. We don't know all the facts of the case. So there are a lot of other compulsions also. But as of now, uh, law doesn't not not allow you to present. You can. And that's what happened. I think pressure coaches in the last this year alone, 30 resignations have happened. So when you modify an opinion, uh, the, the heading also has to be modified, right? So the para heading should be qualified opinion, adverse opinion or disclaimer opinion as whatever the situation. And the key words you should look at, if it's a qualified uh, opinion, it says except for or the possible effects where you're not, it's still estimated or you're not fully sure of the effect. When it's an adverse opinion, they're talking about significance of the matters. And when it comes to disclaimer, you do not express an opinion. It is very, very clear. Please do not express an opinion if you give a disclaimer of opinion. You have no opinion. Because you, you have no idea what, what it is. Because you are not been given either access to books or major chunks of the books of accounts are missing or you have not had access to it. So you cannot express an opinion when it comes to a disclaimer of opinion. And that's, that's exactly how it should be worded as well. And the heading which is the basis for opinion should also have to be modified accordingly. Once you qualify an audit report, you are required to <coughs> give a description of it as well as quantify it. So this is the para which states that you need to give a description and quantification of the financial effects of the misstatement unless impractical, impractical. Why I have put this individual and aggregate is because if you have multiple line items of qualification, you have to give each line item and then give the possible effects on profit, profit after tax and on the final network of the entity. These three aspects have to be always, that's why I put, put in individual as well as aggregate effect has to be disclosed in your uh, audit report. Next thing I would like to talk about is uh, emphasis of matter and other matters. The main difference between emphasis and other matters is when you are emphasizing something, it already exists in the financial statement. That means there is a note that you are trying to emphasize in your audit report. When it's an other matter, this note doesn't exist. So only those aspects which are not contained within the financial statements, you still want to emphasize it, then you try to bring it into other matters. Otherwise, it generally stays in emphasis of matter. And you also have to have a heading which says emphasis of matter and if it is another matter, it is heading is other matter. See, no more you need to uh, do this bold and italics and all that, that concept is now uh, gone because all of these things are given as separate para headings and you need to bring it under the respective paras. And those paras are all in bold. That's the format that uh, essays of respect. So this italicizing which was an earlier concept is, is no more uh, practice. So these are the exclusions from uh, emphasis of matter. If you do a, a, I mean a modification, then it cannot be brought into a, a emphasis of matter. Uh, disclosures in financial statements that the applicable financial reporting framework requires the management to make or that are always necessary to have fair presentation. I will, I will skip that because it doesn't make sense. I mean it's practically something that we don't use effectively. In a Companies Act format, everything is prescribed so that really doesn't happen. So if 701, that is key audit matter, applies, you cannot bring that matter into an emphasis of matter of para. So if, if it's a key audit matter, it stays in the CAM para and cannot be brought into an emphasis of matter para. And the last part is what I would like to highlight, which is a major departure from what it used to be. The going concern assumption, or if there is any significant uncertainty regarding going concern, it yeah. Even though the company, I mean, if, even if we didn't disagree and the company is doing badly and you want to emphasize it, you would always put an emphasis of matter para. It is now pulled out of this. It is now being bought under SA 570 which says that you have to have a heading called significant or material uncertainty. <coughs> Highlighting uh, the going concern issue and this reporting has to come under that. And it can no more be put under emphasis of matter. This used to be the most common emphasis of matter para that is used. 
going concern. So that way, this is there is a major change or exclusion from an EON. Here, the going concern concept. Typical cases are where, let's say, there's a loss making unit continuously, and there's a future M&A that is possible, right? Where management says, okay, this year it is still a loss, but we foresee that in the near future there will be an M&A, and, and that's why they uh, yeah. have the deferred tax. You could even have a, a holding or a subsidy set up, but the subsidy is not making any money because the initial years, and then the holding is given a. Uh, you know, a, a sort of a hand holding uh, this thing that they will keep supporting it till it breaks here. So in, in such a case, if, if that hand holding is not there, the company cannot survive. Right? It, it has no uh, this thing to no legs of its own. So in those those are also cases. Owners and auditor expert uh, opinion on that part that uh, yeah, is it going to happen or it's not going to happen? So that is exactly where they have highlighted that it's only up to the data by audit report. <laughs> Future events. We don't know. It can affect the going concern. That is why they bought out that in our auditor's responsibility para. This used to be the common uh, thing that a lot of people feel that if auditor's report is there, then going concern is always up. It's never, you know, never in doubt. But that is what they're trying to. No, so you could bring in that. Like currently, there's always a question of going concern, but likely plans for a yeah. M&A of future. So this is where the note in the financial statement should be quite elaborate. or should highlight. What are these assumptions? You know, on what? What are the bearings on which you are assuming that this uh, company will continue in the near future at least? You see, you cannot give any uh, statement forever. You can only say near future. That's maximum. So based on these 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 uh, matters, you are concluding that it's a going concern. That aspect has to be highlighted. If you and before you used to highlight an emphasis of matter para. Now it has to be brought into a separate para with a heading separately. So. Now, where do you place the EOM and or OM? This is also a, a you know a tricky thing. You know, where does it come? So the standard is very clear. Uh, the revised standard is, has given a little more leeway. It says that it, 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 to, a, to some extent it is it is based on your uh, judgment. That's why if you see the emphasis of matter and key audit matters are given the, to uh, uh, you know to the arrows, so it can be interchanged. And the other matters also can come after the auditor's responsibility. Especially if the other matters pertains to uh, a scope limitation and a responsibility, like in a consolidated financial statements, or let's say a public sector bank, the bulk of the audits are at branch level, and those are done by other auditors, right? So you compile all the information and then rely on that to give up, give your final audit opinion. So to that extent, your responsibility has has been actually uh, you know uh, based on somebody else's opinion. That aspect is important in other matters. In fact, this is uh, after the revision. The other matters para includes specifically on uh, branch audit. Before the branch audit was not being brought into this other matter as in terms of uh, examples. So, if you see bank audit reports, it, it, it never used to be highlighted in other matter para. It used to be highlighted in some of the other para and the auditor's responsibility, wherever the auditors deemed it fit. But now the example that's given by the institute, uh, I mean by the institute and the SA itself, has bought uh, exactly the same uh, this thing there. A, a bank uh, branch audit concept is being highlighted in a other matters para. <coughs> so these are the usual matters which are discussed in uh, an emphasis or an other matters para. A change in accounting policy, a significant accounting policy, a significant uh, subsequent event, an impairment test or a long term strategic investments, and CFS excludes entities which are fully impaired. OM does a change in auditor, previous year figures, unaudited accounts of group entities in CFS, audit of branches done by other auditors. See, branch audit in India is compulsory on a company side. Right? 143.8 requires every branch to be audited. And if it is outside India also, they are saying it should be audited by the, yeah, under the law. If the law requires uh, under that jurisdiction, under that relevant country to be audited, it has to be audited and the auditor can rely on that. Otherwise, if you read it, in prima facie, it looks like the auditor here has to audit those accounts, even if audit is not applicable in foreign branches.
Uh, this is what, what what we would call in a in a Excel a circular. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, in a circular yeah. 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 so it's an analytics uh, story. So yeah, that's not practical. So, so this is a very important uh, standard from this year onwards in terms of reporting where you need to highlight this. So it means more work because you have to read all this uh, extra information and going you know start going through it. So the one good thing is, or the starting point would be to take classes and report and run to three, four of the, make sure, you know, at least, you know, there is no major differences. If there is a difference last year, 100% you can make sure the same mistake is there this year also. I have uh, also looked at uh, specific aspects of, uh, I mean, I am not going too much into Carlo because the time is not enough. And a uh, couple of uh, issues in 143.3 which I thought were really uh, interesting. From a Carlo point of view, I am just highlighting where are the major changes. It's already 2016 and we are in 2018, so it's what under the bridge has been discussed enough. So one of the major changes was this title deeds of removable property. In in Canada, KDB used to give only leasehold properties. And you had an option to convert it. And the, so it is where the lease comes sale. Now I think they are giving only lease. So that's what those there was some amount of discussion going on for that. They have still not made up their mind. Either. So what happens in a leasehold improvement, I mean a leasehold uh, land, how do you report all this becomes like, extremely uh, important. Then section 185, 186, uh, these are all replacements of the earlier uh, laws, but it's nothing very new. 177, 188. Generally, it's not applicable to private companies. It's all 177. The audit committee will not apply. 188. It's for private companies. They have modified the 270. I mean, section 276 to cow. I mean, there's exemption given to private limited companies. So the arms length pricing under 188 is not really applicable for I mean, for private companies. Payment and management remuneration. Uh, one important thing is default of payments to governments. They specifically bought in this. That was not there before. Then frauds on the company by its employees or officers. This is also an addition. Very similar to 143.12. Non-cash transactions and requirement to register under 45 1A of the RBI Act. This is again uh, what they call a 50-50 test. That means it, the entity is primarily based uh, into financial financial sector or lending. And what they mean by that is called the, how, do you, how do you identify that? It's called the 50-50 test. That means if, if more than 50% of its assets are from financial assets or more than 50 percent of the gross income is from financial uh, uh, assets, then it meets that uh, requirement and uh, hence you are supposed to get that entity or uh, NBFC registered under RBI and if it's not, it's pretty serious. It's a very regular, I mean, Sir, payable goods or payable This is car 2016, sir. Yeah, it's applicable from the government. From 1670 onwards, it's happening. Any different kind of frauds here on the 143? Uh, it's the same. It's, uh, it's kind of it's overlapping. There is a limit. Here, I think there is. Uh, sorry, I'll try to add to the fraud. Here, they have also highlighted frauds by the company, and uh, I mean frauds on the company as well as on the company by its employees in this. In fact, it's not there, I think, in 142. It's there only in color. This is again a departure from what used to be the stand before. What happens if you have a debit balance in PNL? So, the limits for uh, cargo availability is uh, one crore of paid up capital network actually, paid up capital plus reserves, okay. And uh, turnover of uh, 10 crores or borrowings beyond uh, 1 crore. Now, net worth of 1 crore, if you have a debit balance, if you have, let's say, a 2 crore uh, paid up capital and you have 1 crore 50 lakhs of accumulated uh, losses, that is and yeah, it has to be net worth. This was not the position earlier. So, that way, and if the company doesn't meet any of the other uh, criteria, you can uh, not apply uh, cargo. So, from that, from that point of view, this is a significant departure from what used to be the position earlier. This is because they have interpreted the changes in Schedule 3 and how they have arrived at it. And finally, because now the surplus and deficit are sitting in reserve and surplus only. So they said that's the concept which is being internationally followed, so we should go with that. 
this is some of the specific clauses under 143. Clause B, which is about books of accounts. And in today's age, it is now electronic. So I have also looked at Rule 3. So this is where it gets a little tricky. It says that books of accounts and other relevant books and papers uh, maintain electronic mode shall remain accessible in India. That means it can be host culture in India as long as you can access it from here. But come to the next para. It says if you when you back it up, it has to be backed up in servers which are physically located in India. This is very very uh, dicey situation. So please look at it very carefully. Lot of international companies, the backups are not here. Lot of them put it on Amazon web services, and those servers are not in India. Many times outside India. Some of them will have it in their headquarters in different parts of the world. So then, how do you? Uh, yeah, exactly. So this is a very important thing. It's a very basic requirement. We a lot of us kind of bypass it because we take it for granted. So we can see it, I mean, it's there, it should be here, right? But when you start going into the wording, it's, it's, it's a bit tricky. I, I don't know why they said the backup should be here, even though access only has to be here. For, for viewing live data, the backup should be physically available. I guess that's the main, it's, it's the law enforcers who have looked at uh, this, I mean, who've been pushing this. So in case it goes bad or they go, you know, they shut shop and run, at least the backup is somewhere here, yeah. Otherwise they just plug, pull the plug, that's it, you cannot access it anymore. So from probably from that point of view is the why they said that the backup should be physically located in India, yeah. This is another uh, specific clause. <coughs> so any uh, observations or comments that the auditors has on financial transactions or matters which have any adverse effect on the functioning of the com company. This is a very uh, sweeping statement and it's highly judgmental. But it's a reporting requirement that we have to be very careful. So if, if, you're, if you're actually commenting on going concern, then this also has to be commented upon. So any major litigation which you think, if the litigation goes against the company, it might go bankrupt. Or it's dependent on a single uh, customer or 50-60% of its income is coming from two, two vendors, I mean two customers, and one of them has gone bankrupt. That information is available public, in the public domain. Those are aspects that you will have to know, very carefully look at it and then whether you have any reporting obligation under this uh, particular clause. So these are clauses we uh, generally don't report on, only if it is positive do we report on. It's like the 143, 1, 1 A, B, C, D, E, F, right? So this is something like that, but, but you have to be really careful in terms of uh, how you go about reporting on this. Some of the aspects that you are highlighting on a key audit matters, See, as you start giving more and more disclosures in your audit reports, right, some of these uh, clauses will become very, very tricky because these are peculiar to our country and the uh, essays are taken from international essays and this kind of reporting in uh, regulatory matters, no, is not there in most countries. So this car, one for, this is very peculiar to, to Indian and you know, South, our countries like us, it's not there in most of the other nations. That's why the essay and this not always <coughs> gel together. So if you modify or give an emphasis of matter, you have to be extra careful in looking at whether it has any adverse effect on the functioning of the company and then conclude uh, accordingly. These are generally a couple of the matters which I look at as I said before, going concern or even uh, litigation. These are some of the examples that the guidance that Institute has put out on this. And uh, last but not least, this is any qualification, reservation or adverse remark relating to maintenance of accounts and other matters connected therewith. So the, the guidance has concluded that only if there is a qualification or a modification, only then you need to look at uh, reporting under cross H, not in any other uh, scenario. So if there is a modification and if, if there is something in that, in that modification which relates to maintenance of books of accounts, you are not got access to it or something is not exactly as per company's act, 
then you will have to appropriate the word 143H. This I thought was, uh, instead of come out with the announcement on CFS, there is a lot of doubts on how do you treat uh, audited, not audited, material, not material and all that. So they come out with uh, a, a clarification. I just tabulated it, what happens if it's if it's unaudited and if the material, if the subsidiary is, is not material, then it's optional disclosure, you don't have to say anything. <coughs> if it is audited by another auditor and if it is not material, again it is optional. If it is audited by another auditor but it is material, you have to disclose in other matters. One of the examples I given was, all these components are done by so and so auditors and it contains uh, you know, assets of so much cash flows are so much, income or so much which are from their reports. If it is unaudited and it is material, you have to qualify, as in you have to modify your audit report. So if it's a, if it's a subsidiary or a JV or an associate and it is a material component and it has not been audited, either you can audit it if the management is willing and it is practical. If it is not, you have to look at modifying your audit report. That's it. So, any questions? Any, any reason why after this, what do you call this? Extended reporting has been brought in place, why Taro should still be raised? Because you can have to be Taro. I don't know how you can get it. I mean, I don't think the regulators in our country will ever let go. See, the viewer cards in our country, from what I have seen, every time they try to dilute something, it will come back in another form. So, the dilution and self governance as a concept is not something that bureaucracy has not yet come to terms with, at least in the 21st century. They're still 50 years behind what the rest of, us, rest of the world is doing. Maybe a good thing, maybe it's India specific, we don't know. This is all something that time will tell what is good for us, what is not good for us. Interesting part is it's very difficult to expect your parent company what is that it should be Absolutely. As I said, this car or its predecessor, the Mao car or not, it is something which is very specific to India. Most countries don't have it. But one way is good because the regular, see if the regulator is really doing his job of regulating then they are capturing all the information, what are they doing with it? That's the next step, right? I don't know. So now all of these aspects are captured very well in your uh, AOC forms and all the respective forms. Each line item has got a separate field, everything is captured. So I'm pretty sure they press a button and all the qualifications and how many companies, which is the most qualified part, everything will come out. But what have they done with it? Have they published a report? Have they called up anyone? These, these are matters which are right now unanswered. About two years ago, the CNAG had uh, pulled up CBDT. I don't know if you've read about that. There's a very scathing report. They said India was one of the first nations to go if into the electronic filing. Right? In 2006 7 we started filing electronically for companies using digital signatures and all that. Many of the developed nations did it three, four years later. So they have good 10 years of data and the CNAG asked what do you do with it and they had no answer. So they said they have, you have 10 years of data and you have done zero analysis. And they came out with a report which said that there was one particular charter account in Calcutta who had signed 993 reports. Are you aware of this? One more 2400. Huh? That is the kind of information that is readily available. Nobody can sign 100. If you sit from September 1st to September 30th, <laughs> physically signing even 30 reports a day, it will never finish. So, I mean, it's way beyond the limits, obviously, but you can imagine to what extent uh, people have gone and to what extent information is readily available with the regulator and he has not done anything about it. So, your question is absolutely you know, relevant and valid in today's time. What is the regulator doing with all the information? You have so much information, what are you doing with this? We don't know. Maybe in the future you start having uh, much more uh, of a uh, uh, involving bureaucracy it comes back to us with more relevant data. Hopefully they'll publish more, more of these information. That is for bureaucracy to change. 
there is something that is done. See, the political class has to change, only then the bureaucracy will change. And all that comes from within us, we only elect those people. They are not coming from the neighboring states. Reporting and reporting. <laughs> exactly. See, all this is connected. We cannot say that this is not connected. All of these aspects are connected. Financial reports, finance, money, everything is connected. Commerce, industry. We cannot say that this is not connected. It's a reflection of our society. It's how we treat things. Generally, everyone is suspicious. If people have money, you're testing it. Hmm. <laughs> how do you get that kind of money, right? So that's the general uh, attitude of people. It's it will probably change. The next generation might say we don't need it, right? So because if you see how you want. Well, earlier Bob I was there, then IFC came in. So reporting on the same stuff. Then why you still retain Karo? You already have IFC on which you are reporting. Now this additional reporting has come in, but still Karo is there. I had actually when IFC came in, I thought it was an overkill. So I had written to the through the BCAC uh, all the way to uh, they were collecting information. I told them. Internationally, I, this is nothing but your uh, socks. Yeah, exactly. Socks in US, US and UK also has something called a governance code. Yeah. Okay, it's exactly the same thing. It's applicable only for listed companies because there is actually a difference between the ownership and the management, right? In a private sector, in a private limited company, where the husband and wife is running the show, what? What ISC are you going to implement? Right? So, because it comes at a cost yeah. and it's practically not possible to answer those kind of questions. So it makes a mockery out of it and it makes a mockery out of us to have to answer such things. At least last year they came up with some limits of saying I think beyond 50 goals only to report. Otherwise it was absolute mockery. They should take up limits of 200 to 250. What is the limit for? Internal audit. Otherwise unless it is significantly you know, or systemically important, it's what RBI uses. The concept is called systemically important. There could be private limited companies but they are of such large size that if it fails, it will have a reverberation across the industry. So what they recognize is systemically important entities. I can understand you want to regulate the class. Those kind of yeah, public interest entities and systemically important entities you regulate. Beyond that, why do you want to regulate? You have regular companies that audit for company. Then you do IFC audit. Then all these extra standards, key, key audit matters. Then you will do a tax audit. Then you have a GST audit, cost audit. That's already six audits. And if somebody loses money, the government pays back to the private pay. The government is not going to give back the profit. I mean, if there's a loss, is he going to give, make it good? No. So tax audit is done from a point of view of uh, tax evasion. Fine, no hassle. <coughs> Go ahead and do it. But you see the tax, latest tax audit report. At class 44, what is it? They're trying to implement uh, GST. Yeah, yeah through, uh, in, uh, through income tax uh, this year. Yeah. It's again going back to the old system, 43P. Genesis of 43P is because nobody is paying excess duty. People collect and keep. <laughs> we don't pay our own giving credit. So, you are trying to implement one law using another law. So, that's the whole uh, you know, bureaucracy which, uh, unless political class intervenes or uh, there's enough pressure to build up to say that, come on, let's give, you know, remove something. They have done that, I'm not saying, you know, a lot of it, uh, dilutions have happened in companies like. Then when the 2013 act came, it had become very, very tight because uh, you know the overarching uh, rules and uh, regulations. No private people could. You cannot lend money this way, that way. You know. So directors are afraid of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it goes to that extent. And then the guys who want to do anything will do. So the whole concept should uh, probably be leave it open. You improve your uh, regulation, regulatory aspects of collecting information, then take action on it. That means, uh, the, what do you call the, uh, exactly, the people who are on the ground, your intelligence uh, agencies should do its job. Not uh, go after, you know, everybody. The people who are actually doing it is the ones who should be sought, uh, rather than painting everybody with the same brush. So, that change is yet to happen. It, it, it probably will happen in, in time. Actually, there is a company which has two branches outside India. Yeah. And uh, we are auditing the books of accounts sitting in India. Whether in that uh, audit report, we need to mention the books of, books of accounts are outside India, but they are the like soft copies. Or how to mention that in the audit report? Okay. See, if the books of accounts are uh, accessible, you are talking from the point of view of the backup or from. Not backup. Not backup. It's a branch actually. That's fine, as long as you have audited 
we are comfortable with that, then the standard is okay. If it is not audited by anybody, then we have a major issue. But we need to mention that the books of accounts are maintained outside India. No, it's no. only no. accessible now. There is no self reporting. If you don't comply, then you have to report. Yeah. IQFR is a specific clause, I, but it is, in terms of its uh, scope and depth, it, it is like another parallel audit is it. So in terms of time that has been spent by an auditor doing uh, IQFR, uh, what is commonly known as IAC, this considerable amount of time that is spent in uh, documenting all this, speaking to people, uh, documenting the processes, then test checking it, uh, you know, it is. It becomes another assignment. Itself. Yeah, another assignment itself. So it, it is not a statutory requirement at the moment. It is very much a statutory requirement under 143 3 I. But comment on the internal financial controls. Yes. You have to comment on the internal control, the financial control, that is operating effectiveness. That is what is the assignment and operating effectiveness. Exactly. It is an overkill for private companies. For public investment company, absolutely makes sense, but private company, I'm not sure. Anything else? So I try to keep it brief, so I think I finished within my time. <laughs> yeah, so all if you can go home. You're just trying to beat traffic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. one-day workshop on private limited companies and uh, related companies at uh, Provision for Chartered Accountants. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank C. Abraham Lee for giving an excellent presentation. Big round of applause. Uh, I also thank other two speakers of the day, C. Pradeep Suresh and C. A. Shradrao for their uh, uh, gracious time and coming over for and giving a good presentation. Big round of applause for them also. As a token of appreciation and gratitude, I'd like to present a small memento. I would request C.A. Pampa Natukani come forward and present a memento to C. Abraham. Round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Also, thank all the members for active participation. Next, we are having. Uh, Four day workshop on advanced GST for chartered accountants starting from 16th of August to 19th, and also one day workshop on concurrent audit of uh, bank branches on 21st August 2019. I request all the members to kindly participate. 